A young girl has the power to set everything ablaze, and there's a secret organization that plans to stoke the flames for their benefit. But first, they have to find her, so they get the help of a tracker with powers of his own. This is the origin story of Weapon X, Stinguisher Needed. So pull out the marshmallows for X-Men Origins Fire Fist. Hello there, you loose units, and welcome back to another episode of Spicy Boy Reviews. I'm, of course, your host, Andrew Isles. Yes, that's right, we have another remake from Hollywood on our hands. Uh, this is adapted from a book by Coke fanatic Stephen King, and also a remake of the 1984 film Firestarter. This version is directed by Keith Thomas, who had a little bit of indie buzz with a little indie horror called The Vigil, and, of course, Blumhouse decided to throw him under the bus with a remake of a Stephen King cult classic. It's a tale as old as time. Telekinesis, a boy falls in love with a telekinesis girl in a laboratory while they're both being tested on by a shady organisation. They fall in love, and of course there's some superhero serum fuckery being injected here, and BOOM! They have a kid together, which is totally normal. Until that kid gets anxious, angry, or upset. And then she sets shit on fire. That's right, the little offspring here is a level 5 mutant named Charlie, who is a fire starter. They, of course, live off the grid in hiding, if you will, so the evil organisation DSI, as they're called, can't find them. Charlie's dad here is played by Sex on Legs' Zac Efron, uh, who's constantly convincing Charlie to push her powers down and suppress them deep within, which can only go well. He, of course, has his own superpowers. He has the ability to make people do what he wants with his mind. So pretty much like actual Zac Efron, because every time he's around, pants just fall away. And, of course, Mummy Poos has her own powers as well. She can move shit with her mind. Of course, Charlie has a little spat at school with a bully. A bully that can only exist on film, you know, openly calling her a freak in front of teachers, and they do nothing about it. And, of course, she cracks the shits and blows the door off a toilet. I mean, big deal. Have you ever worked on a building site before? Those blokes blow the door off toilets all the time after a night of all-you-can-eat Mexican. And, of course, this gets the attention of the evil organisation DSI, who was ran by, you guessed it, an evil, power-hungry boss bitch who took over the company for her own power-hungry ways. Whoops, no, not that one. I mean this one. But not to get her hands dirty, she employs an ex-inmate of DSI to track them and hunt them down. And he has powers of his own. He can read minds, I think. Hmm. A Native American actor playing a tracker here. A little on the nose, don't you think? The movie then becomes a road movie, and they travel to one location. And that's it. All wraps up pretty tightly here, because Discount Eleven teaches herself how to control her powers in, ooh, about ten minutes or so, just before the climax. She learns to light a bundle of sticks on fire, boil some water in the creek, and uh, telepathically forces three boys to give her uh, their sandwich, their bike, and their jacket. <laughs> Stupid men. She then breaks into the DSI and tortures everything, blows it all up, uh, because she finds out that she's the best that ever was, best there ever is, and the best there ever will be. The end. That's it. It is anticlimactic as fuck. This film went nowhere. It was superfluous and boring. It was only an hour and a half, but I swear it felt like three hours. They had the opportunity here uh, to ride the, the genre of superhero films with a subgenre of horror superhero, but they just shat the bed. And also, what horror? It was minuscule at best. We see some burn scars, I guess, but every time there was an opportunity to see some full-on horror, the camera just cut away. The film was really bland and boring and came across as like a shitty remake from the mid-2000s. It also had that drained colour look that all Blumhouse films seem to have. If I was an optimist, I'd say that they were all based in the same universe. Who knows, we might get some crossover movies uh, in this universe. The Bloomverse, if you will. The only good thing I can say about the film is Kurtwood Smith was in it. That's right, from Robocop and that 70s show fame. It was just good to see him, and it just reminded me of how much I miss seeing him in films. The marketing for this film was... Non-existent. I didn't really see any of it, and everyone I talked to had no idea this film was coming out. And now I know why. I think Blumhouse wanted to bury this film, honestly. It's almost like they wanted it to go down in flames and then piss on the ashes. <laughs> it looks like they're putting all their faith into the black phone, because, yeah, that marketing's crazy. I've seen that movie advertised everywhere. That film seems like it's really carrying the torch for Blumhouse. <laughs> 
So don't worry, Drew Barrymore, your legacy ain't been touched because this film is not lighting anyone's world on fire. <laughs> Alright, enough! No more fire puns! Anyway, guys, that's my review of Firestarter. Have you seen it? Uh, write down below if you have. And do you like it better than the original? And of course, if you made it this far into the episode, please give me a thumbs up because your love and support keeps me going because I just love movies and I assume you do as well. And of course, don't forget to hit that subscribe icon because we give out episodes weekly and we'll see you back here next week for the next review. And until then, stay spooky, kids. Mm -hmm.